an infamous child killer, a slumber party child killer who blindfolded a group of little girls about age 12, drags one out and strangles her dead, set to walk free over my cold, dead body. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us. This man succeeded in what he was trying to do, which was pierce my son through the heart and pierce the rest of the family. It was just plain despicable, and it shows the kind of people child molesters are. Yes, it does, and I am referring specifically to a child killer, Richard Allen Davis, sentenced to death in the brutal murder of a beautiful 12-year-old little girl, Polly Class. Listen. He broke the contract. For that, he must die. And Mr. Davis, when you get to where you're going, say hello to Hitler, say hello to Dahmer, and say hello to Bundy. And good riddance, and the sooner you get there, the better we are. We all are. Truer words were never spoken, but since that time when he got an chewing, technical legal term, in court by Polly's father, Mark Class, he has been given three hots in a cot ever since. In the last days, we learn he, Richard Allen Davis, the killer of Polly Class, could walk free. Joining me in all-star panel to make sense of what we are learning, but first, I want to go to my longtime friend, and colleague, Mark Class. You hear me talk about him often in completely unrelated cases because I compare every parent, every loved one, whether it's a mother, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa, an uncle, a boyfriend, a husband, a wife. I compare them to Mark Class because when Polly went missing, Bam, 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 bam on class's front door. He opens it up and he says, take my fingerprints, take my blood, search my place, search my car, search my office. Hurry, do it now. I'll do anything. I'll take a poly. But f find my daughter. Quit focusing on me, please. Time is ticking. That is smart class. And since his daughter's death, her murder, he has devoted himself to finding missing people, solving unsolved homicides. His whole life was contorted and twisted by Richard Allen Davis. Mark Class, thank you for being with us. What went through your mind when you heard about this proposed legislation? Well, it was a stab in the heart, Nancy, and what it did is it just pulled everything right back up to the forefront. It brought the crime back to the forefront, the trial. You know, I think about Polly all the time. I think about Polly every day. But once this guy got onto death row, I put him out of my mind. And there have been very few reasons for me to think about him or to consider him at all over the course of the last 30 years. But this, and the reason for that is because he's been given absolutely every consideration somebody can have. He, he had a, a great defense team at trial. He, uh, he's had several appeals. He's even lost to the California Supreme Court. And I thought it was finished. I thought that was done then. And now, thanks to the California legislature and the interpretation of new laws, it's been thrown right back in my face again. And uh, so one has to deal with it. One has to deal with the raw emotions. One has to deal with the regret, with the hurt, 
with the pain. And uh, I've been doing that over these past several weeks. And it, it's not a it's not a fun or easy thing to deal with, I can assure you. Man, that's certainly a euphemism. It's not fun or easy to deal with. When I think back on my fiance Keith's murder, it sometimes can actually make me sick if I allow myself to think about the moments that he endured just before he finally died and went to heaven. I think, did he, did he feel it? Did it hurt? Was he afraid? What happened? What were his last words? I think about all of that. Why wasn't I there? I think about that. Now it's all back because of legislation and the interpretation of that legislation that waters down convictions. Um, who is this guy? Who is Richard Allen Davis? Listen. Richard Allen Davis is an ex-con out on parole after serving eight years of a 16-year sentence for kidnapping. Parole to a halfway house for convicts with alcohol and drug addiction, he gets an overnight pass and drives his Ford Pinto 60 miles up the California coast to Petaluma. Davis goes to a park, smokes a joint, and drinks a beer. He's two blocks away from the home of 12-year-old Polly Class. She's having a slumber party with two friends. Davis sneaks into the home, grabs a knife from the kitchen, and goes to the room where the girls are setting up sleeping bags. He threatens the girls with the knife, ties two of them up, gags them, and kidnaps Polly Class. It takes the girls 20 minutes to free themselves, and they run to Polly's mother, Eve Nichols, who calls the police. And more. 90 minutes after kidnapping Polly Class, Richard Allen Davis gets his pinto stuck in a ditch. The owner of the secluded property, Dana Jaffe, gets spooked and calls police. Police talk to Davis, help him get his car out of the ditch, and send him on his way. Two months after Polly's disappearance, Jaffe calls the police again after finding a sweatshirt, girl's clothing, and other items on her property. Jaffe says she thought it looked like a crime scene and tells officers about the stranger from two months earlier. The search for Polly Class has been international news for the last two months, and investigators quickly pull up their records from the incident and find the name, Richard Allen Davis, an ex-con with a long rap sheet who most recently served time in prison for kidnapping. Back to Mark Class joining us along with an all-star panel. Mark, I pulled up Polly's killer's rap sheet. It goes all the way back to age 12, arrested for burglary, then forging a $10 money order, burglary of another home. His father turns him out over to juvenile for incorrigibility, then motorcycle theft, then um, goes into the Army, then he goes AWOL, discharge, arrested again, public drunk, arrested again, liquor, burglary, contributing to the delinquents of a minor. wonder what that was. goes on and on. Um, I'm, I'm cutting through a lot of them, but then we go to more burglaries. Residents becoming angry and upset. Burglary, burglary, burglary a school burglary, it goes, I mean, I've got pages and pages and pages and the offenses turn violent. This is the guy that's going to walk free, Mark Class? Well, not only do the, the, the offenses turn more violent, but he's also at this point been diagnosed as a sexually sadistic psychopath. And what this character did is he just went through this turnstile system of justice repeatedly, uh, Every time he gets out, he can he, he concocts a, a more uh, violent crime, and it just escalates and escalates and escalates, and he's given chance after chance after chance until he finally and ultimately grabs Polly and murders her, her and uh, walks away from the scene. In 76, escapes from the Napa State Hospital, goes on a four-day crime spree, breaks into the home of Marjorie Mitchell, a nurse at the state hospital, beats her in the head with a fire poker while she slept, stole a shotgun from an animal shelter, then kidnaps Hazel Frost, climbs into her Cadillac outside a bar, 
I mean, it goes on and on. He gets 20 for kidnapping, 25 years. He gets out and keeps doing the same thing, robbing a yogurt shop, robbing a bank, confesses to crime, more crimes behind bars, more kidnappings. It's, it wasn't just Polly that he kidnapped. He's got a string of kidnapping. And what happens when he is finally apprehended in this case? Let's take a listen from the horse's mouth. First thing, let's get your first sex. Is she alive? Just come in and look at her. She's not, she, she's not alive. You know, he says it just as cold and cool as a cucumber. She's not alive. We're talking about a 12-year-old little girl taken out of her own home at knife point during a sleepover with her little friends. You know, Mark Class, I rarely ask you this, but could you go back to that night and tell us what happened from your vantage? Sure. I, I was uh, sleeping in bed with, with my then girlfriend, now wife Violet, and uh, she answered the phone. It rang, and, and uh, I remember her pushing the phone away from herself saying, no, 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 tell Mark. She handed me the phone, and it was uh, Polly's estranged stepfather, Alan Nickel, and he said, Paul, basically, he said, Polly's been kidnapped, and the police don't want you coming up here trampling evidence. I then spent much of the rest of the evening contacting the police. I contacted the FBI because of the Lindbergh case. I thought, wow, if anybody knows about kidnappings, it's the, the FBI, and uh, they immediately dispatched a local agent to the scene, and that was Eddie Fryer, who's on your panel tonight. And uh, the next morning, we got up and we went to Petaluma and uh, stayed there then for the next two months, trying to trying to get Polly back. You know, Mark Class, the way you tell that is almost by rote. Well, listen, it's it, it, asked so many times, but I, I know better than that. Well. <laughs> I mean, it was a, a, a th it was disbelief. I mean, it's really disbelief. You can't even believe that something like that has happened. We stayed up all night. At about six in the morning, one of the local news stations, a radio station, announced that Pauly Class had been kidnapped. And that's the point where, you know, it, it really, really started to set in. And we knew that we had to start calling family members. And it was just one. These are the most brutal phone calls you can even imagine. You have people gasping. You have people crying. You have people swearing on the phone. And, uh, you know, then we went up to Petaluma and we went to Polly's house. And the place was surrounded by satellite trucks. It was just it was almost surreal. It, 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 it took a little bit of time to emotionally adjust to all of this, to emotionally understand that. But boy, once you go down that rabbit hole, it's really, really hard to get back out again. And we just spent two months focused on nothing but getting Polly back. I lost weight during the time. I almost gave up several times during that time. It was just brutal. It's the most brutal thing an individual can go through, I think, trying to recover a daughter that's been kidnapped in a community a large community with a history of child kidnappings that were never solved. First thing, let's get your first sex. Is she alive? Just come in and look at her. She's not, she, she's not alive. You're hearing it from the horse's mouth. Richard Allen Davis. I usually don't even say his name. I usually say Polly's killer. This is the man that gets a knife and goes into the bedroom of Polly Class, blindfolds her little friends, and kidnaps Polly. He's got a long history of kidnaps and attacks. His crime started at age 12. And now legislation and the interpretation of that legislation threatens he will walk free. Listen to more. He told police. Why don't you tell me what happened that night? So I was parked downtown. There's some park along some main street. So I went over to 7-Eleven, got a quart of beer. Mm -hmm. 
went back, sitting in the park, had my car parked around the corner. Which car did you have? I had to pin them. You know what's interesting? Eddie Fryer joining me, lead FBI agent on the Polly Class missing turn murder case. Eddie Fryer, I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but I've dealt with a lot of defendants and they'll start talking and they're very free telling their story. And then all of a sudden, when it gets to criminality, things, quote, get fuzzy. And that's where they don't remember as well. The part where he drags Polly out of her bedroom, that part. Absolutely. Uh, in the case of Richard Allen Davis, um, when he um, confesses, now I don't like to call it a confession because it's uh, woefully short of a confession. His statement is riddled with deceptions and lies and omissions. And, and he crafts this story about being in Petaluma that night, having a beer and smoking a joint. And he somehow ends up in Paulie's house, doesn't know why he picked that house. Uh, enters the bedroom. He's kind of foggy about uh, the events in the bedroom, but he ends up taking Polly out of the house, puts her in the car, and he, he drives around that night. It's late at night. He ends up uh, on Pythian Road, uh, and, and he gets the car stuck. He says he, he, he doesn't know what to do. He gets her out of the car and puts her up on the hillside, just a few feet away from the car. Uh, that's when he has the encounter with the two uh, sheriff's deputies. They escort him off the property. He waits, he says, 30 minutes, maybe a little bit longer. He goes back to get Polly, finds her up on the hillside there, says she's unharmed, uh, just sitting there uh, as if she was waiting for him to come back, gets her back in the car, drives around a little bit uh, longer that evening, ends up in Cloverdale, and... He has to get out of the car, and, and that's when he says he um, he strangles her and kills her up there in Cloverdale. Now, uh, he's he's questioned quite a bit about what he did with Polly in those hours after the kidnapping. He's very evasive. You can tell he's he's lying because of all of the behavioral characteristics in his tone, his pitch, um, the words he uses, that sort of thing. But uh, clearly, clearly, um, you know, he missed going into the house, tying up the girls, taking Polly out of the house, and ultimately uh, killing her up in Cloverdale. But he leaves a lot out of this story. But the, but the evidence says a lot uh, happened between the kidnapping and the eventual killing of Polly up in Cloverdale. A lot happened such as what? Well, when you look, examine the uh, crime scene up there on Pythian Road, um, and, and again, that's where he, uh, he took Polly after the kidnapping, the crime scene itself suggests a lot. Uh, at the crime scene on the hillside, we find uh, a large uh, men's black sweatshirt laying on the ground. We find a condom. We find a condom wrapper. We find uh, red tights that belong to Polly. We find the ground visibly disturbed. Um, all of that suggests uh, that there more than likely was some sort of an assault up there on the on the hillside. And then, and then later when we we cover the body from Cloverdale, the state of her clothing on the body suggests that there was something that that, that happened to Polly either up there at Clo uh, on Pythian Road or Cloverdale. Um, and the jury, the jury heard that evidence. They weighed all that evidence, and, and they found that there was more than likely an assault of Polly Class up on Pythian Road. Mark Class with us, Polly's father. Mark, usually I do not condone any misbehavior in a court of law, but there was a moment in court that you actually lunged at Richard Allen Davis, if you could have gotten your hands around his neck, what would you have done? You know, I kill the son of a bitch. What I do, if I had an opportunity, I'd love to put a bullet in his head. I'd love to choke the life out of him. I'd love to treat him the same way he treated my daughter. You know, he just deserves nothing more and nothing less. 
unfortunately, you know, this guy's had the benefit of what did you call it? Three squares and a, and a bed daily for the last 30 three years. Three hots and a cot paid yeah. for by you. By me. And now because of this newly enacted legislation uh, and the way it's going to spin out and be interpreted, he is now asking for a reversal. Guys, speaking of what Richard Allen Davis said, listen. He's kind of got fuzzy after that. What do you remember about that one? Uh, just going in through the window. Which window did you go in? The front window. Okay. Guess I went in and told him all to lie down or whatever. And, uh, where were they? They're in the bedroom, I guess. There's three of them in there, I guess. Okay. Hmm. Did you hear that? And I want to go to Dr. Sarah G. West, forensic psychiatrist specializing in sexually devi deviant behavior. You can find her at ForensicPsychiatristMD.com. Professor of Psychiatry, Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. West, thank you for being with us. Did you hear what he said right at the beginning, Dr. West? He says, things got fuzzy after that. It's like... He got transported. Have you ever seen um, Harry Potter where they can transport to another location just like that? It's like he was riding around, having a joint, drinking beer, and then all of a sudden he says, I, I, I guess I went in and told them all to lie down or whatever. And where were they? In a bedroom, I guess. There were three of them in there, I guess. He's like, whoa, why am I here with a knife in my hand? How did that happen? Because he broke in and threatened three little girls, age 12, with a knife. And then takes one out and rapes her and murders her. Polly Class. So in terms of memory lapses, I suspect that a lot of defendants don't necessarily want to take ownership of what they've done. Uh, I don't know that there could be an actual memory lapse, more of just big answers to avoid accountability. There's a very real possibility the slumber party killer could walk free after kidnapping, raping, and murdering a 12-year-old girl that launched a lifetime of pain for her father, my friend, Mark class. You hear him, Mark, talking about the next thing I remember, I was driving down the road and I heard in the front seat, uh, got turned off some road. He's glazing over everything he doesn't want us to know. But the fact remains that he, he did what he did and he tossed her off the side of a freeway and he covered her with plywood and was somehow able to, to take the authorities back two months later. I, I, I don't know what to say about anything that this guy does or says. It's, it's all self-serving. It's all to help his situation. And the last thing he wanted to do was go to prison as a, as a child rapist. I mean, there's even a code of conduct within the prison walls and these guys are at the bottom rung. So, you know, he was doing everything he could to, to mitigate his situation, I guess. If you have any doubt that this guy is a stone-cold killer and child rapist? Listen in his own words. She was still alive and everything, you know? Trying to figure out what the f I'm gonna do at that point. And the car got stuck. I had her get out of the car. I had her sit up on the embankment. Mm -hmm. I tried to get the car out. Couldn't get it out. The lady came down. Where was she? When the lady came down. She was uh, sitting up on the embankment. Joining me now, in addition to Polly's father, Mark Class, and the lead FBI agent on the case, Eddie Fryer, John Woolfolk, reporter, San Jose Mercury News. Uh, John Woolfolk, investigative reporter, thank you for being with us. Tell me about the legislation. 
Uh, so this was a bill that was designed to uh, help reduce the prison population in California. Um, and the idea was that uh, uh, people who had a, a sentencing enhancement for prior convictions, uh, that some of those would not uh, be counted. And um, this particular bill uh, was retroactive. And so it applied that retroactively uh, to people who had already been convicted uh, and were serving time for sentencing enhancements uh, uh, that uh, under recent legislation uh, uh, would not be allowed. So um, now I, I spoke to the, the, uh, the man that passed that law, Ben Allen. He's a, a assemblyman from uh, uh, Southern California but he, uh, he told me uh, in, in no uncertain terms, he did not think that his uh, law would uh, apply in this case uh, or uh, lead to uh, the undoing of any uh, uh, death sentences uh, for convicted killers. Um, really? So is yeah. that what Assemblyman Ben Allen thinks? He thinks that somehow Richard Allen Davis is going to be treated differently? Uh, guys, Richard Allen Davis, convicted of murdering Polly Class, seeks to have his death sentence overturned. Legal motions are happening now to make that happen. Mark Class joining me, Polly's father, in addition to John Woolfolk, uh, San Jose Mercury News. Mark Class, did you ask to find out how many inmates, including killers, rapists, child molesters, this new legislation spearheaded by Ben Allen, the assemblyman, how many inmates it would affect? Yes, of course I did, because I kept reading about this list. So I uh, contacted the CDCR, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I made a Freedom of Information request and uh, was ultimately sent a list of about 93 to 9,500 names. So the thing is, uh, besides my family having to go through this, there are 9,500 other victims' families that are going to have to relive their pain. They're going to have to take their case back to court. District attorneys throughout California are going to have to prepare 9,500 briefs for these and tie up court resources for possibly years to come. And that's one of the main reasons that I brought attention to this. I just think it's completely outrageous that the guy that wrote the bill didn't even understand what he was doing. And the consequence is that monsters are going to be given an opportunity to get back into society. And when you're, you're dealing with 9,500 of them, you better believe that some are going to fall through the cracks. So our case really is nothing more than the tip of the iceberg. Out to Sam Dordulian, sex assault lawyer, former L.A. County sex crimes prosecutor and founder of the Dordulian Law Group, who now represents sex attack victims. Sam, thank you for being with us. You've been on both sides. I'm not quite sure, having seen what you and I have seen, you can defend uh, sex defendants, but... That said, how is it that this guy, Ben Allen, the assemblyman, doesn't even understand the implications of the law that he got passed and all in an effort to help, quote, reduce prison population? What about innocent people like Polly? What about all the innocent children, uh, women, victims waiting to be people waiting to become victims when these guys are let out of the penitentiary. So Nancy, I just want to make it abundantly clear. I never represented any sex offenders. I actually represent survivors of sexual abuse now, um, civilly. I'm so glad to hear that. I see you in a completely different light. Thank you for telling me that. Go ahead, please. Absolutely. And, and you know, these laws, People pass these laws focused, especially in the last 10 years in California, on these supposed progressive agendas. I don't see anything progressive about these legislations, but the focus is on the criminals. 
Never once do these legislators think about what will be the impact on the victims? What will be the impact on the survivors and the, the victims of these families? That's never in consideration. It's all about how is this going to impact the criminal and what are we going to do to see uh, helping them out? And that seems to be the focus. And, and it has to stop because allowing a man like this, and I say man, it's probably more like an animal, to be returned back into society or at least have the opportunity to be returned back in society is just not something that we should ever, ever consider. Why don't you tell me what happened that night? So I was parked downtown. There's some park along some main street. So I went over to 7-Eleven, got a quart of beer. Mm -hmm. Went back, sitting in the park, had my car parked around the corner. Which car did you have? I had to pin them. I was out of the car, mm -hmm. and, uh... What? That's when I strangled her. I was just coming back to the car and getting back in. Strangled her? Yeah. What would you use to strangle her? Just you are hearing convicted killer Richard Allen Davis describing the murder of 12-year-old Polly. To Mark Class, this is Polly's father. Mark, could you believe it when you heard about this legislation? No. Well, I don't know. I mean, since 2011... The state of California has been doing everything they can to empty the prisons, uh, negate or eliminate the death penalty, uh, kill the three strikes law. And as your previous guest said, it's all designed to help the criminal. And there's absolutely no consideration at all given to the crime victims community. Uh, they could care less about us. I know that for a fact. So I, I was surprised I guess to some degree, but you know, it, it didn't hit me like a sledgehammer because it's expected in the California legislature now for these kinds of things to happen. It's just an erosion of public safety one after another after another. And although they claim that the crime statistics have gone on, you have to look deep into that and see how crime has been skewered in California People will tell you one after another that that crime is going up and up and up. And you can just see it in San Francisco with every major retailer practically that exists is pulling out of that city because of crime. And it's the same with violent crime. So was I surprised? I guess to some level I was surprised, but it, it wasn't the body shock that it might be in some other place because California has been moving down this path for a long time now. Governor Jerry Brown and now Newsom, uh, they love to sign this kind of legislation. They, they, violent criminals have an amazing and great advocate in Sacramento, and it happens to be the governor. This is a crime that struck fear into the hearts of parents across the country, across the world. This family did everything right. Mom was at home sleeping next, door, next to her daughter in another bedroom with another daughter. When out of the blue, in the middle of the night, in comes Richard Allen Davis and kidnaps Polly with a knife. The search following that was horrific with Mark Class doing everything he could think of to bring Polly home alive. Mark, do you remember when you learned that Polly's leggings had been found, what, what she had been wearing? Uh, yes, I do remember that. I remember it specifically. It was during a meeting with uh, two uh, law enforcement officials. Eddie wasn't part of that meeting. And... Uh, they told us that they had found these things at the Pythian Road location uh, where Dana Jaffe discovered them. 
And uh, they then tried to convince me that Pauly was dead. And it, it became a, an unbelievably contentious meeting because even at that point, I wasn't willing to accept the obvious. I, I felt that she was alive and that uh, all we had to do was, was talk to Davis and convince him to tell us where she had hit him. And it was, I guess, five days later that the, the hideous truth was ultimately revealed. To Dr. Sarah G. West, Associate Professor, Psychiatry, Case Western Reserve. Dr. West, I had a similar reaction, um, and I think many crime victims' family, murder victims' families do. They don't believe it. They refuse to believe it. And they can cannot, concoct all sorts of scenarios other than, other than the one I love is dead. They've been murdered. What is that? I suspect, Nancy, that that has something to do with the brain being self-protective. Uh, of course, uh, recognizing and acknowledging trauma to that level is a very difficult thing to do. To Eddie Fryer joining us, the lead FBI agent in the Polly Class case, what is your recollection of the search for Polly? Oh, my God. Um an unprecedented effort by all stakeholders. I'm not just saying law enforcement agencies, but nonprofit search groups, the community, the family. It, it, uh, it, was, it was a unified effort uh, by everybody nonstop for 60 days that we searched for Polly. There wasn't a stone that we didn't look under. There, there, there wasn't a lead that we didn't pursue. We had over 60,000 tips in 60 days, 12,000 plus actionable leads. That is, that is unheard of in that amount of time. And we had, we had if not dozens, hundreds of uh, agents and detectives working every day tirelessly, nonstop, 24-7, for one purpose only, Nancy, one purpose only, to find Polly Class and to bring her home. This man succeeded in what he was trying to do, which was pierce my son through the heart and pierce the rest of the family. It was just plain despicable, and it shows the kind of people child molesters are. He has made innocent people suffer, and truly the honorable way out would be for him to commit suicide. It's the least he can do to alleviate our pain. But since he does not have the goodness or the courage within him to take even that step, the state is placed in the terrible situation of having to make that decision for him. When I look at Richard Allen Davis smirking in court, as Mark Class talks about the murder of his daughter, I just want to snap his head off. And this is who may walk free due to enlightened legislation spearheaded by Ben Allen, the assemblyman in California, potentially affecting over 9,000 violent inmates that could be released in an effort to help reduce prison population. I mean, John Woolfolk, uh, investigative reporter, San Jose Mercury News, what exactly does the legislation do? Break it down for me. Uh, State Senator Allen's uh, bill extended uh, some other legislation retroactively uh, to affect uh, old cases, including Mr. Davis's uh, he had, uh, uh, among the, the things he was convicted of is, as you mentioned, he had a lot of uh, prior crimes and convictions. And uh, under the law at the time, you would get additional sentencing enhancements for those. Uh, more recent legislation uh, struck some of those. Um, and uh, Senator Allen's bill uh, uh, extended that retroactively. Um, the, uh, so in lawyers. other words, any type of similar transactions or prior convictions 
would be watered down. It would not be any justification or any aggravating factor at a DP death penalty trial. So how do we go about stopping this from happening, Mark Class? Oh, we do. It's the only thing we can do. It's in the penal code now. So you have to reverse the penal code yet again. But with the current state of the legislature, that will never happen. These people are intent on one thing, under the leadership of the governor, or three things. They're intent on eliminating uh, the prisons, I think. I mean, they're already, they're down to 77,000 people. These are not overcrowded prisons. And believe me, after all of the people that have been released, these are terrible people that are still in our prison system. They're trying to do that. They're trying to kill three strikes, and I think I've mentioned it before. They're trying to finally and once and for all eliminate the death penalty within California. And each and every one of these measures is designed to do nothing more than benefit the criminals and hurt the victim's community. And that's just appalling, immoral. It's illogical. It, it's, it's just the worst. You know, Mark Glass, in all the times we've spoken about Polly, you are very surgical in your analysis of what happened when you retell what happened to Polly and what it has done to your life. The burden that you carry, the banner you wave helping crime victims and dealing with Polly's murder is it ever too much, too heavy of a burden for you? Well, it, it, yeah, it, it's become kind of overwhelming, and that's why we're closing the Class Kids Foundation at the end of this year. It, it just carrying the burden for 30 years is carrying other people's burden is what was my own for 30 years is is. Is, is, is an awful lot. And uh, I can continue to carry mine. I have no choice about that. But, but uh, as for the rest, uh, I'm, 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 I'm worn out. You know, I'm, I'm wasted. It, it, it's, there's very little left. And now this. And now this, yeah. That's a, let your voice be heard. 916-445-2841. Repeat, 916-445-2841. We stop now and remember American hero, police officer Justin Hare, just 35, shot dead trying to help a disabled vehicle in New Mexico, a family man expecting a third child with longtime fiance Desiree. He leaves behind his parents, fiance, and two daughters. American hero, Justin Hare. Thanks to all of our guests, particularly Mark Class, but especially to you for being with us tonight and every night. Nancy Grace signing off. I'll see you tomorrow night, six o'clock, nine o'clock sharp Eastern, and until then. Good night, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.